Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC guy. After a lot of requests from you guys, I'm finally going to get around to doing a steam locomotive. So today we're going to take a look at installing a DCC decoder in this 40 year old MDC Shea locomotive. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. But before we go on, hit that little red uh, subscribe button and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Thanks now. Well, before we get started, I want to take a few minutes for the uh, feedback segment. And I want to start off by saying that several people uh, have asked me for a copy of the CV29 table that appeared in uh, my video on CV29 oh, about two years ago. So what I've done is I've uploaded a uh, PDF copy of that to my current website, LarryPuckett.wordpress.com, and I'll put that in the description too. But if you go there, you'll be able to download a copy of that PDF uh, showing a table for all the values of CV29 and what they uh, give you. Now, the second thing I want to touch on is something to do with the comments themselves. And that is, I'd like to ask, please, if you're going to ask a technical question, please just take a few minutes to scan through the comments under the video related to what you're going to ask and make sure that somebody else hasn't already asked it and I've already covered all of that material. Uh, recently, I've been getting a lot of requests for material that were covered in the comments. So all you have to do is read those comments and that way I won't have to go back and address the same comments over and over and over again. Now, with respect to last week's video on signals, I did get uh, quite a number of questions and many of them uh, were repeat questions. A number of you ask about the yellow light on the three LED signal head. And what it comes down to is there's only two rails on a track and only two DCC power bus wires to connect your LED feeds to. So you've got a choice of two colors that you can use. Red and green, yellow and green, yellow and red, whatever. It's up to you to decide what you're going to go with. And part of that depends on the prototype that you follow. And if, you have, if, you're, uh, if you're not following a specific prototype, then you need to do a little research and decide what you're going to use. Commonly, you would use either red and green or red and yellow and go that route. But you're not going to be able to use all three of those colors unless you get into a much, much more sophisticated uh, signaling system that probably is going to involve using uh, JMRI, uh, Panel Pro, or some of the other off-the-shelf logic uh, systems that can control all three colors and multiple heads and all things like this. So it gets very, very complex very, very quickly when you start moving from a simple system like I showed you to one that can do a lot more. And I'll touch on that uh, in a future video when I get to the point where I'm able to show you the system that I'm using here on the Piedmont Southern. However, one thing that I have done to answer some of your questions now is I've uploaded a PDF of an article that uh, Model Railroader was distributing for free on their website uh, for a number of years on signaling. And you can go to my WordPress website, larrypuckett.wordpress.com, and right at the top, you can see a download for the signals PDF. It describes several different approaches to signaling and the way that you would implement it on a model railroad. So I think that's all that I need to cover in the feedback. So let's go ahead and move on and start taking a look at uh, installing a DCC decoder in a steam locomotive. So what I have for you today are two locomotives uh, made by MDC. And uh, MDC, Model Diecast Incorporation, uh, is now owned by uh, Horizon Hobbies and has been incorporated, I believe, under the Athern line or along with the Athern line. In 19, around 1982, 83, something like that, they introduced this model here. This is a, uh, a Climax locomotive and it's uh, uh, used on logging railroads a lot. And uh, then they also uh, came out around 82, 83 
with a Shea locomotive. But they sold a lot of these. They were in production for a number of years. And then after Horizon purchased them, they continued to make these in a ready-to-run version because originally both of these models came in a kit form. So I had to put these together myself back in the early 1980s. So that was 40 years ago. The interesting thing about this, they have a very nice five pole motor, but it's not skew wound and it is not very high efficiency. So let me show you what that means. If you keep an eye right here on the milliamp output or the draw from the motor, I'll show you what, uh, what, the, uh, what it draws. So as you can see, we're up to 0 0.46, 0 0.47, half an amp almost, and the locomotive is barely crawling. Matter of fact, if I kick this up and hold it, we're up over an amp when you start, when you get up to 50% of throttle on my uh, power pack here. So these things can draw a lot of amperage. And uh, given that a current model with a nice high efficiency can motor might peak out at around somewhere between a quarter and half an amp, um, these suckers really draw a lot of power. But it's not easy to find a motor and gear system to replace these. Northwest Short Line for a short period of years did make a replacement motor and gear set for these. And Un unfortunately, it's no longer available. Uh, but you can still operate these with the old motor. Uh, you just have to be aware that it's going to take a lot more current in order to operate them. And so on a small model railroad, uh, you can probably run two of these with a power cab, let's say, in operations and get away with it without any problems. If you start adding several of these and running them at the same time, you might need the uh, SB5 addition to your power cab. You might need a bigger booster if you're using some other type of DCC system. So what I'm going to do today is, because of the high current draw, I have here a Digitrax DH126 decoder. And this is a standard HO size decoder. It's rated at anywhere from one and a half amps uh, normal operations up to two amps peak. So this is going to be able to, to uh, sustain enough of the amperage to drive this locomotive without any problems. Now, interestingly, this one here, which is a little bit older, a year or two older in, uh, in its origin, uh, I'll show you, it pulls slightly less power. There it goes. So it maxed out at what, about 0.9 amps. So it draws less current uh, than this one. It has a very similar motor and I'll take the shell off and show you both of these here. They just, you just pull the sides out and they slide right off. And here is your five pole motor. You'll notice it is not skew wound. The mechanism just isn't up to what we expect today as far as that goes. Basically the way both of these work is they have, uh, in this case, it's got a, a, a gear drive mesh system here, but it's got this large a circular gear here, and then a couple of universals that connect to driving the trucks. And it's the same here on this locomotive. You can see the large tubular uh, structure or cylinder structure here, and then the universals that go out to each one of the trucks. Now, unfortunately, because of the um, because of the inefficient motor and all of the gearing that's involved, these are pretty noisy. And I'm not sure that there's any way to get around that because, like I said, the Northwest Shortline Regear Kit is not available. So what I'm going to do today, though, is I'm going to go ahead, let's disassemble this one so you can take a look at the mechanism here. The uh, tender body just slides right off. There's a couple of metal posts that hold it on. And then the cab slides off. So it's easy to take this apart. And then you have the five pole motor here that sits on the frame. Now, this system uses the frame as part of the electrical pathway. 
And as a result, that means we're going to have to go to some extreme measures to isolate the motor from the chassis itself. And just to show you that, you can see here, this is one of the wires that goes to the motor. I'm going to disconnect it from the connection to the chassis. And then we're going to tighten it back up here. So even though I have disconnected this wire that goes to the motor, you can see that the locomotive still runs because there is a physical connection between the motor and the frame itself. So you don't even need that wire attached. What I'm going to have to do then is take this apart, isolate the motor, and then we will put it back together and wire it to a decoder. But before we get into that, let's talk about lubrication because this locomotive has been in storage for 30 some years now. So what I'm going to do first is I'll show you how to disassemble this and uh, then I will go ahead and do some lubes. So the first thing you want to do, of course, is, re is loosen this screw here, which holds the motor in place, and then it just slides right out. That's all that holds it in is that one screw. And then right over on this side here for this red wire, and let me zoom in a bit to show you guys this. Okay, so what we have right here is this red wire is attached to a screw that goes through to the bottom and makes contact with the pickups under, on, under the locomotive. And then that wire comes up, or that screw comes up through the chassis through a plastic uh, bushing that prevents any uh, shorts from occurring. So I do need to take that one out and that just means loosening this screw right here and that will come loose. So that's all it is as far as the motor is concerned. Now as far as these motors, uh, I do recommend go ahead, take your oil, and this again is my medium weight uh, plastic compatible uh, oil. And uh, I don't remember, this could be the Woodland Scenics version, I'm not sure. But anyway, just put a little drop of oil right here at the front of the shaft on the motor so that you're lubricating that bearing in there. And then for the rear bearing, what you'll see on these motors is there's a piece of felt right in here. And if you apply some oil to that felt, it's going to be absorbed and it's going to go down into the felt and that is slowly going to be released over time to lubricate the rear bearing. So that's how these motors work. You'll see all of them just about have the magnet here and then that um, little piece of felt to absorb the oil. So that becomes your oiling system. So that it's going to be in good shape. Now, one thing I did when I was testing this before doing the video, this uh, universal connection here had cracked, just like all old plastic seems to do anymore. And so what I did was I cleaned it up, degreased it completely, and then I reinstalled it on the shaft using super glue. And the super glue tends to squeeze out into the crack and holds the uh, plastic together, and it also attaches it to the motor shaft. So that has worked fairly well on a number of uh, cases that I've used that approach. Okay, let's look at the underside here and I'll show you how this mechanism works. So as I said earlier, we have this uh, round gear here uh, mechanism, and then we've got these universal shafts that connect to the trucks. Okay. So how do you get those apart? There's no screws. Well, it's a simple friction fit connection here. There's this little metal pin that comes out from the chassis and it fits into a hole in the top of the truck itself. So that's all that holds it in place, a friction fit. So then we have here a, I don't know if this is copper or brass or bronze or what, but it's a little plate that is in contact with these pickups here, wipers from the, the wheels uh, on the trucks. And so it carries current back here and connects uh, to the insulated contact that I showed you through this screw. And that is on both of these. We have one here, and then there's another one of these back here on the back that picks up from the rear truck, and we got the front truck. And then there's another wiper on the front of these that goes to this flat spot here on the chassis. So you can see this spot where there's no paint. So that's a direct contact to the frame itself, and that powers the motor through a direct physical contact uh, 
through that screw that I, I loosened to get the motor out. Now, what else? Let's say another thing that I wanted to do here. Uh, these have not been lubricated since the day they were built 40 years ago, but it does seem to be moving fairly well, as you saw. I'm still going to take a little bit of my white Teflon grease. This is my HL657 white grease hobby lube. And I'm just going to squeeze some of that through this opening into the interior. And then I'm just going to take this sharpened end of a uh, Q-tip here and poke that grease down in here to where it can come into contact with the gears inside of this mechanism. So that's going to keep that nice and well lubricated. It's probably also a good idea to go ahead and lubricate the uh, contacts here on the axles to keep those moving freely. There. You don't need a lot. You just want to keep it moving freely there. So we got that taken care of. What I want to do next is get this thing back in place. And that's not an easy job because it requires getting that universal lined up at the same time as you line up these shafts on the drive mechanism for the shea itself. So it's sort of like herding cats we're trying to push a wet noodle into place somewhere. There it goes. So it finally dropped into place. And then turn it over and fit the universal back into its slot here. And I just need to turn this to get them to line up. There. Now that's all there is to it. And then we're going to put it back into place on the bottom. Okay, so that's connected. Now, another thing you might want to do with these is go ahead and lubricate all of your moving parts in here just to make sure that nothing is going to freeze up on you. They seem to be pretty well lubricated uh, themselves. There hasn't been a lot of, of loss of the oil over the years. So that's all back together. Hidden inside the boiler here, there's this gear mechanism that I mentioned and showed you in the uh, MD, the uh, Climax, what I have to do is get some grease onto the top of the gear here. So I'm just going to squeeze some out onto the top of it. And I can't show you that because it's inside of this. You can barely see a little bit of the white. That is the gear lube. Okay. So I'm just going to smooth that down into the gears here and give that a spin with my screwdriver, and that's going to get that lubricated and keep it lubricated for a few more decades, I guess, hopefully. Okay, so there we've got that. Now let's go ahead and talk about isolating the motor, because we've got to be able to do that. We don't want any shorts to occur uh, once we install the motor back in the locomotive and install the decoder. To begin the process of isolating the motor and getting it back in, uh, I'm going to take a Q-tip here cotton swab dipped in alcohol. And I'm just going to wipe this down real good. Make sure we don't have any oil down in here that's going to uh, interfere with the tape that I'm going to use from doing its job and sticking tight. Okay. So hopefully that's gotten any oil and grease off of there. Okay. Now, how do you go about isolating this sucker? Well, that's not exactly the easiest thing in the world. I'm going to wipe off also some grease and oil from the bottom of the motor because that's going to be in contact as well. There. Okay. Now, so remember that motor goes in like that. I'm going to take this screw right here out. That's the mounting one because that would give us a dead short in there. And what I'm going to be using, let me show you. And what I have here is a little black nylon screw. And I got these, I think these came with some uh, KD couplers, uh, one, of the, one of the KD coupler sets that came with these mounting screws. I really don't remember. Uh, but you should be able to find nylon or plastic screws at your local hobby shops. Even Hobby Town should have these. And then I'm just going to take and cut this off so it's about the same length as the original mounting screw that came here. 
and clip that. Doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, so I've got that. And that is going to fit right in here in that hole on the side. And that's going to serve for holding the motor in place when we get to that point. And it's going to be insulated. Now, but we have to have a piece of insulating tape here on the bottom and on the inside of this upright mount. For that, I've just got plain old black electrical tape. And I'm just going to get some of that out here. And we'll cut a strip. Uh, I'm going to place that right here on the frame. Get that lined up perfect before it sticks. There we go. I think that's good. And then take a flat screwdriver and just press it into place. So that isolates the motor from the bottom. We also need to isolate it here on the side. So I'm going to get another little piece of my black tape. We're going to attach it here to the side inside of this motor mount. Got to make sure I've got it all the way down there. There, that's good. And we've got that in there. Good. And then I'm going to take my X-Acto knife and just cut around the edges here. So I need to take and tip this where I can see what I'm doing. Okay. There. And then on the sides, I'm just going to wrap it around to give it even more protection. So there we've got black electrical tape on the chassis here and on the side of this motor mount. Now I know it might be difficult to see, it's black on black. Okay, we've got that much done. I'm going to go ahead and install this, uh, reinstall the motor using my insulated screw on the insulated chassis. I believe that's a Phillips screwdriver actually. There we go. So that's loose. Now I'm going to go ahead and we'll connect the red wire to the insulated side. Okay, I've got it in there. And I'll hold it and tighten that up. Okay, there. Okay, that should be totally isolated. Okay, so I went ahead and uh, off camera made all the connections for the decoder. So you can see I've got the red wire here connected on this side for the pickup uh, from the chest, uh, from the uh, uh, trucks. I have the black wire attached right here so that it is picking up off of the frame connection as original. And then I've got the uh, orange wire going to the old red wire and the gray wire is attached to the old black wire. And these go to the motor brushes. Now, in putting this together, you have to be very careful doing this because there's a metal spring that runs between the two brushes. And it's insulated at this end. There's a little plastic insert that prevents those uh, from making contact with the motor brush arm itself. However, it can slip down and make contact with this um, black wire contact here, and that shorts across the brushes. And I had that uh, happen a couple of times to me, so you have to be very careful here. Uh, this is an old design. It obviously was not made to be DCC friendly. But at any rate, once I got everything in here and properly tensioned again and set up, it does run. So let me put it together and we'll go over to the layout. Okay, I got the uh, cab and the tender back on and on the layout. So let's give it a test drive now. This 
This is really not bad performance at all from a 40-year-old uh, a locomotive with a motor that is not all that efficient. And we'll run her back into the yard here. Now you'll notice I did not say anything about adding lights or sound to this locomotive. Um, lights are a little bit difficult in this case because I tried and I could not get the boiler off. So I don't know, I'm, I might have epoxied on back then. Uh, I'm not sure. And unfortunately it's not hollow at any rate. So I, I, I don't think there's any way to, in, to uh, run wires through the front of the boiler. Um, I probably could just run a couple in and across the top of the boiler and back to the cab, something like that, and uh, hook it up that way. It'd be fairly easy to, uh, to install one in the tender because that's just a direct connection there. Sound would be difficult. Uh, there's no place in the tender for a speaker. There's really no place in the cab except maybe uh, attached to the roof for installing a speaker. So that's a wrap for this week's video. Please go ahead, start digging around in your stash of old locomotives and dig out some like I've just shown you and give it a try installing uh, a decoder in one of those locomotives. And as far as that goes, there's just tons of these old MDC locomotives floating around out there at train shows. And uh, as soon as you can get back to one of those, you can look at picking up one of these as well. Other than that, that's all I have for today. So have a great week and we'll see you here next week with another video from the DCC guy. Bye now.